So the roll has been taken. Brantford Accessibility Advisory Committee is now called to order. To begin, we will go over some rules of procedure. This meeting is held in hybrid format in accordance with the electronic participation policy for virtual meetings. The full corporate policy 050 regarding electronic virtual meetings is available online to review. Staff and delegates are reminded to keep their video and microphones off until requested by the chair or members of committee. All cameras for committee members shall remain on to ensure quorum. Members of the committee shall indicate they wish to speak by physically raising their hand. Members who are present in person will be given opportunity to speak first, followed by virtual participants. All members of the committee will vote by a physical show of hands. Please leave your hand raised until the chair has determined the result of the vote. In the event a connection service interruption occurs that affects quorum, we may recess the meeting for up to 15 minutes to regain quorum. If quorum is not achieved, the meeting will be adjourned. All rules for delegations under the city's procedural bylaws continue to apply. Decla declarations of conflicts of interest. Are there any declarations of conflicts of interest for any of the items listed on the agenda? Presentations and delegations. We have no presentations or delegations in open session today. Private and confidential items. As we are having a training session today, I will need a mover and a seconder to move the motion to go in camera. Asking for a mover and a seconder for the following. So right now we're just looking for a mover and seconder. Okay. Can we have a seconder? Okay, thank you. So Mayor Davis and Chris are moving and seconding. We just need the reasons for uh, going into in-camera. So I'll just make it clear that we're going into in-camera for the purposes of receiving training from members of staff on AODA compliance and procedure. Number five items for consideration. There are two items for consideration on today's agenda. 5.1, Dufferin Park redevelopment design update, financial impact, none. 2023-76. Okay. Um, I will ask staff to come forward to provide an overview of this item. Okay. Does it give a quick rundown of what's going on there? Yes, please. So um, the item that we've We've already brought Dufferin Park as the entire park forward to the committee. So now we have the floor plans for the building that's going to be constructed there. It's going to be um, a single floor plan with unobstructive access from the uh, front and the back of the building. There will be porches in the front and the back to extend the indoor space to the out exterior um, park space. Um, so there's a, the main function of the building is the washrooms. We have a universal washroom and a barrier-free washroom access from the interior of the building and a, an additional barrier-free washroom that is only exterior access that would be open to the public regularly. Um, there's a kitchenette in the little meeting room area. The meeting room would hold about 20 people or so. And the kitchenette has a sink with access to the sink. Um, the microwave is to be counter height, the fridge is to be the side-by-side -side fridge, all of these things have been discussed. Um, the furniture inside would be movable and there will be benches um, on the exterior of the building that would be spaced far enough that there's maneuverability around these benches as well as the, uh, they're like patio tables kind of with some seats and there's accessible spaces at those as well. May I have a mover and a seconder to place the motion on the floor? Hi. And 
Chris. The report 2023 76 Duckburn Park redevelopment design update be received. Is there any discussion or questions? Yeah. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. So to start, when, when you're developing a plan like this, uh, what's the process that it goes through to determine that all the accessibility <clears throat> standards and requirements are met? Does the architect do that? Does the designer, like, what's the process? Just, just to make sure that everything is I's are dotted, T's crossed. And... Yeah, so the architect just make sure that everything meets the OBC. Um, for it, it came forward with the design of the building. We also review it to make sure it meets the FADS uh, document are a little bit more stringent sometimes with our uh, details there. And um, we've, I always bounce stuff off of Jenny <laughs> whenever I'm in doubt and, um, and then yeah, bringing it forward to this group as well is just making sure we're just trying our best to make sure that everybody has an opportunity to give their input on the and, and so what is it you would hope that uh, through you, Madam Chair, what is it you'd hope that members of the committee, what, what should we do when we look at these plans? Um, I think that just to be informed that uh, this is the intent of the building, that, um, you know, things like the universal washroom, it will be only accessed from the inside of the building. And we have reasoning for that is, um, you know, because somebody who's going to be staying there longer would probably be using the building as well. And they may need to use the universal washroom, but we had concerns with um, vandalism, I should call it, I guess, to have it be open as a, a regular park, everyday washroom that's less supervised. So we have like little things like that. I just want to make sure that everybody's um, happy with the design and able to use the space uh, all freely, um, as well as the porches. I mean, this is a very unique building. We don't have anything like this in any of our parks. So I'm just excited to bring all the details forward and see everybody be able to use the space indoors and outdoors um, easily. <laughs> so I can see that, um, you know, what's built into here certainly is accessibility for those that um, have challenges in terms of physically getting around. What about the sight disability or hearing disability? How's that? Yeah. How does that work in there? What do you do to, to deal with those, those challenges? Yeah, so um, for visual disability, being that this park is right adjacent to W. Ross McDonald School, um, we've actually consulted with them a couple of times now just to see how we can make the space more maneuverable for them to see how they're going to be using the space probably pretty regularly for um, teaching especially and they've given us great pointers of little things that are they're not a rule to anybody like they're not in a in a building code or fads or anything but placing a rock in a certain location at the beginning of a path can be so helpful to somebody with a site impairment or disability. Um, and I think that just bringing that forward to whatever groups we can to get their input is something that we do. And then, um, yeah, we'll, we'll be including more braille, particularly at this park than we do at normal parks, just because the size of the park, as well as the proximity to the um, W. Ross School. Good, thank you. I've got some cool ideas for some um, tactile maps to uh, put in the park. I think we don't have that anywhere. And I think it'd be really cool for um, not only visual disabilities, but also just autism and textures and feeling out the site. I think um, we're trying new things all the time and see how it's received. <laughs> yeah, this is in continuation to the accessibility um, pathway that was last brought to Yes, so the, um, I think it was last year sometime, September possibly, that we brought forward um, the entire park plan showing the pathways as well as the access to the tennis courts and the playground and the basketball courts. So we didn't have the floor plan and the design of the building at that time. 
um, but we wanted to move forward with the design and get it out to tender. So um, we just thought we'd bring this up as another step. So it's a little bit easier to comprehend when it's not all these things thrown at you too. Fantastic. Sorry. Yes. Yeah. It's hard to see. My mm -hmm. side. Um, I'm just looking at the artist's rendering of the back patio. Mm -hmm. um, is there an accessible um, ramp that's going on and off the back patio? You just can't see it. Yeah. So the rendering makes it appear that the patio is raised from the ground around it, but it will actually be flush. And there will be paths that connect to the patio in multiple locations. Like it's kind of the center point of the park. So it branches off like a spider kind of on the design and uh, it's all flush with oh, pathways. Oh, that, um, yeah, yeah, you're right. It, page mm, it looks like it's a yeah, raised path. It, does. On, on it the must just be the, their like process of rendering and attaching it to the mm -hmm. aerial or the photo that they have behind okay. it. Thank you. Oh, one other quick question. Yeah. Um, the placement of the automatic door opener. Mm -hmm. um, button placement, one of my pet peeves in life. Um, where are we planning to put the automatic door opener? I'll have to double check the exact location on the design, but... Um... Uh, there's kind of a vestibule at the front. So I think within the vestibule, there's two locations to get through the first door and the second door, two buttons. And usually we have it to the right on the exterior. There's benches shown in the um, rendering, but they will not be there because they would be in the way <laughs> of accessing the button. Mm -hmm. But um, I guess we could consider putting it on that post in front of the building. Yeah, so the... And speaking from experience, <clears throat> the um, what tends to happen is when the vendor puts in the automatic door, um, the vendor is not considering. So you're right. If it if it was on the wall, the bench is obviously in the way. The other issue that happens is sometimes the vendor will put it in the door swing and so when the door swings open it hits you right um, and we just i see we've just finally moved the one at the, the door at the top of the ramp here um, which was um which was my uh, first experience when i when i came here but um and so so yeah button placement is um yeah certainly something to consider yeah um, when it uh when it gets down to it and what ends up happening is that, as I said, the contractors or the vendor that's installing the automatic door opener is not always thinking like those of us that have to use right. the automatic door opener. Jenny and I were discussing the automatic door opener as well as the placement of the washer locking button so that it's not confusing to know if you're opening the door or locking the button if you're, yeah. um, if you're having no visual impairment, so. Good. Okay. Thank you. Thinking of it, trying to keep it all straight. <laughs> yeah, so you may sure one more question, Steph. Will there be lockers in this building? No, no lockers. So originally old clubhouse is more of a clubhouse geared towards the tennis. This is more of a community building, um, not really geared to either sports group that you see in the park. And is the building uh, air conditioned? And so it'll be used in the winter as well, or would it be shut down? Uh, it, it's designed to be winterized, but it will have a heating system that would allow it to be used in the winter as well. We don't anticipate much winter. Yeah. For the off the shoulders. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I will now call the vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? There was a hand on the screen. I'm not sure if it was a lag or if it was an objection. Was there any questions from anyone on the screen? Okay. 
that carried. All right. 5.2 Parks and Trails General Update, Financial Impact None, 2023 80. I'll ask staff to come forward to provide an overview of this item. So there's a few different projects listed here. So if you have a question, feel free to just jump in. Otherwise, I'll just continue to ramble on through each project. <laughs> um, so the first one that we have listed is the Powerline Road Trail and Wayne Gretzky Parkway Trail. This is in the north end of town between uh, Powerline Road is between Brantwood Park Road and Wayne Gretzky Parkway. And the Wayne Gretzky Parkway Trail is connected to this, the Powerline Road Trail, and it goes from Powerline Road down to Dunstan, um, Dunstan Street, and it's connected to JC Park. So this was completed last year. We've tried to bring it forward a few times, and we just haven't been able to. Um, so the entire path was a three meter wide asphalt path before, but it was disintegrated to a point that it was not accessible anymore. So it's been reconstructed um, to be three meters wide and asphalt once again. And there's been the addition of a few benches along both of the paths that are now brought up closer to the trail with accessible seating beside the um, benches. And we've added, wherever we've put in a new trail that connects to the sidewalk, we've added tactile plates um, in the sidewalk. So we've updated those. And then we've also improved some grading in the cross slope wherever it was possible to do so on site. So sorry to the chair, to, to you, this, this particular trail, um, there's a bridge somewhere that connects it to the yes. so, park of JC Park. Yes. So this is, Beaver this is, yeah, so this is bringing up a um, constituent uh, issue that just came to light um, probably a week or two ago regarding the condition of the bridge. Yes, so that is a, a separate project and it's that bridge is currently closed and it's being redesigned by our bridge um, structures team. And there will be, not only will the bridge be replaced, but it doesn't currently have a path leading to the bridge. It's just grass. So we're going to be adding in a, a path because it's a bit of a slope that's going to um, have a switchback kind of to make an accessible grade and then connect that path over to JC Park. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. That's expected to be this year. Okay. Um, may I ask about the, I guess the general public proposing that on Powerline Road where the trail meets at Brantwood Farms that there will be addition to it? Like to cross the Powerline yes. Road? Mm -hmm that topic we have a right now like we just replaced the trail as is and there's a bit of an asphalt access to power lane road but no formal crossing mm -hmm. um i'm not sure if that falls within a plan that our traffic team might have oh, okay. but um i can ask about that and see what the future plans are for that okay yep got an answer on that uh, there was a, a motion that Councillor Carpenter brought forward. I think you might have seconded it. Yes. Councillor Hunt. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that does address that because of the, the serious mm -hmm. injury that occurred there before Christmas. Oh. So it's kind of in the works. You wouldn't have seen it yet. Yeah. Um, but can I ask you a totally different uh, question, Tracy? And that's these tactile strips. When do you, where do you put them? And I think I know why you put them there, but what's the, what are the criteria? When do you decide, yes, there should be a tactile strip in this spot? Right, so we usually use them at a crossing um, where the pedestrian access is crossing the vehicular access um, because they're basically getting exposed to a danger. You just want them to be aware that you might not feel that with your cane if you're using a detection cane, um, that you know, you're entering into, you're going from a smooth asphalt surface to a smooth asphalt surface onto the road. So it just identifies that there's a change in the situation, is that the right word? <laughs> a change in your environment to cross, that there's a safety concern. Yeah. Does it, is it also used to indicate, you know, like a potential hazard or is it just simply an indicator as a change in the, either the grade or the, the material that you're traveling across yeah so we always use them like when the path will enter into a parking lot or at a street but we can also use them sometimes you would orient them as a diamond 
um, and make them smaller to indicate where a path crosses another path at a T intersection, because that could be um, something that you'd want to know <laughs> um, to make a decision of where you're going, but um, it's a different kind of hazard than entering a row, right? So we have kind of different strategies that we'll use a whole tactile strip at a road crossing, or maybe just a texture difference on the path, like bump to concrete or something. So every situation is kind of just analyzed uh, specific when it comes to a park because they're so different sometimes. <laughs> Am, am I allowed to? Yeah, please. <laughs> um, you may also see them at the top of stairs. If there are stairs built into an environment, which we are trying to okay. stop. Um, but you will see them on the site plan if there are stairs or if there's another area that people should be slowing down and watching and listening to their surroundings. Yeah, I just had the question because of personal experience, finding it so difficult to bring anybody to Brantwood Farms. Okay. From uh, using public transit to going there because of the, where the plates are and where the entrance way is along with just the one way or two way, no real stop. Right. Yeah, because I think once you get into Brantwood Park Farms, there's not really a pedestrian identified access there, right? So you're well, kind of just left at the edge of the street. It's, like, it's just, that. yeah, it's just such an out there point. Um, if I was at a point with disability, I don't think it makes much sense to go to the gravel eventually that's spanning different directions. Right. And, sorry. Um, and that takes us back to one of those points that I discussed in the training that Brantwood Farms is then not our property. So we can only lead up to, but once you hit that entry, and I don't believe there's a sidewalk on that side of power line. So there's nothing that we would be able to do as a city it's something you would have to contact Brentwood Farms and discuss what they may be willing to do to accommodate that concern. Thank you. Okay, I'll move on from the trails if that's okay. <laughs> um, so the second project I've listed in this one is the Lorne Park Gazebo. The gazebo is actually going up like today. So it's super exciting because it was a really long wait to get that uh, delivered with uh, you know, um, delays in uh, products that we're seeing right now. So this gazebo, um, it's brand new to this park. There was one years ago, um, but this one is, it's flush with the path and the surroundings, has gardens surrounding it. Um, it's very decorative, very Lorne Park-like, you would think. Um, it's very pretty. Um, so what did I say about it? What, other than being accessed directly from the path. We have some picnic tables that are within the gazebo and beside, beside the gazebo, and they are accessible picnic tables included there as well. And a bench uh, with space to sit beside it um, is included in that design, just a small small addition, but it, it looks really nice. I'm really proud of it. <laughs> um, so then Jubilee Terrace, the Howitzer Cannon. The Cannon has been at Jubilee Terrace for years but it has been on a concrete pad that has no path leading up to it. So we've replaced the pad that the cannon sits on and in, included lighting um, to light the cannon at night. And we have added um, concrete paths that lead to the cannon pad so that you can access the perimeter of the cannon. There is a cane detection rail to be installed, not there yet under the, the cannon that shoots up so that you don't hit your head as you're going um, around the cannon. And we have three benches added along in the park, along the path, and those benches, two of them have accessible seating beside them and the third one does not. Um, yeah, so the previous walkways were interlock brick, and now they're all concrete so that they're more accessible surface as well. 
The next one we have is the Steve Brown Sports Complex. We're upgrading lighting there. So there was um, lighting at the red baseball diamond and the track football field enclosure. All of that lighting is being upgraded to better light levels as well as LED lights. And we're adding additional lighting at the Blue Diamond, which is kind of further closer to um, Mount Pleasant Street. And so those will all be brought up to current required light levels for play, improve some visibility there. Woodman Park reconstruction. So um, we have held a public open house as well as a uh, online survey to inform the design of Woodman Park. This is intended to be more of a youth focused park. Um, during the surveys and the open house, we had a great representation from the accessibility committee and lots of comments on making the park accessible. Um, the design is moving forward and there is an intention that there will be asphalt paths throughout the park, benches, playground equipment that is uh, being able to be accessed from the ground and we're seeking some rubber surfacing under the playground rather than the wood chips, just because this will be more of a, um, a feature park within the city. And um, when we have that design ironed out a bit more, we'll be bringing that to the committee as well. Then we have the trail improvements and river access, which we call TIRA, uh, Recognition Garden and Pavilion Improvements. So this is at Waterworks Park. As you're heading from the parking lot of Waterworks Park, you go up a ramp that leads to the dike. And along the park, the path that connects the parking lot to the ramp to the dike, there is a pavilion there. Um, that pavilion is, it's being named for the Margot and Paul Williamson family pavilion. And with that will come improvements to the pavilion to improve the look of it. It was looking quite run down. The roof is replaced and some details to make it a little bit more beautiful. And um, around that pavilion, we're adding a garden and through that garden is pathways, which would include some pollinator gardens and just being able to bring um, people more into the nature rather than being straight on the path. Um, and surrounding pavilion. So we have um, accessible bench going there as well as um, seating beside that bench and uh, the picnic tables under that pavilion are to be accessible as well. I think that's it for that report. Is there any discussion or questions? I will now call the vote. Um, if, if yeah. So we'll just need a mover and seconder to put the resolution on the floor. Mayor Davis and Councillor Hunt. Okay. And now I'll call the vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? Motion carried. 5.3 playground rehabilitation project update, financial impact none, 2023-79. I will ask staff to come forward to provide an overview of this item. Okay, so um, our playground replacement program we undertake playground replacements uh, every year. So this past year and continuing into this year because of supplier um, issues that we've had is Hillcrest Park, Central Park and Recreation Park. The issues with all these parks are the same and the replacement strategy is all the same. So I'll just speak that all of them are not, were, were not accessible and had no pathways to access the playgrounds. They all had sand under the play structures and they didn't have any play features that were accessed from the ground level. So the replacement designs include new asphalt pathways um, connecting the sidewalk to all of the park amenities. We have a continuous paved loop surrounding the pave area so that we can increase the number of access points into the playground area. 
um, including new asphalt ramps so that if the wood chips do settle, there's still a way to get into the um, play space until they can be topped up again. Most of the time those ramps are buried and you shouldn't even see them. Um, then we have new engineered wood fiber safety, safety surfacing around the play equipment. Engineered wood fiber is supposed to be <laughs> wheelchair accessible, <laughs> um, as well as it has a fall attenuating property that uh, if you fall on it, you bounce, like you don't just hit it as hard, it has a little bit of bounce to it. And we have new playground features that will include um, features that are accessed from the ground level. And those will include play equipment for age two to five, as well as five to 12 year olds. There'll be new trees planted around the park for shade and as well as new benches with seating areas beside the benches. And that's the same for all three of those parks. And I have a mover and a seconder. Okay, all right. Is there any discussion or questions? Um, so for each of these, there, there has been input from the users in the neighborhood? Yep. Um, so we've included um, online surveys have taken place. Now these were designed during COVID, so we did not have any um, in-person meetings. They were, um, input was provided through online surveys and we had really good turnouts for the surveys. Over a hundred people responding to each of those, which we don't see those numbers in person. So. Um, we had two voting sessions for these ones. So the first voting um, survey kind of geared towards what would you like to see in the park? Do you like swings? Do you like sandboxes? Do you like more play equipment, more trees, that kind of stuff? And then the second survey was geared towards um, choosing between two play structures that we had our playground designers um, submit to us. So one was more of like an obstacle course style and one was more of a platform style. And people were unanimous that they liked that more platform style um, coming up to the playgrounds. But they, it was very interesting because we feel like the obstacle course is more, uh, has more paths of travel, but we made sure that these, even though they're on a, a platform style, we still have lots that's connected to the platform with the access from the ground. And in the past, um, there have been some comments that with the park redevelopment and improvement program that proper consideration hasn't been given to swingers. Uh, I would argue that because <laughs> I feel like we are providing seating, we are providing access pathways, we are providing shade. One thing that we are going to do to improve further um, park construction is to uh, seek funds to get uh, shade structures because we realize that trees are little when they're planted and the shade isn't very big and it's not always where the bench is. Um, so we are kind of looking for ways that we can make that even better. But um, I think that with our, the paths, the benches, the all the access that we're providing, it is, you know, more geared or accessible to seniors as well. And, and when you design a park like this, do you also consider the like the surrounding neighborhood like some neighborhoods the park becomes like a meeting place right not just for kids but yeah for adults. yeah um in some consultation we have heard from other groups that they want like a seating area to do like dance or um, presentations and uh, outdoor classroom kind of type spaces so we have provided those um, where they were asked for and I think that kind of going forward in our designs, we have more space that that can be included without being so formally designed. Um, that outdoor classroom style, we usually will put a cluster of um, armor stone that kind of lends itself as a, a way to increase the uses of, of the space. Right, and then of course you always include the water tiles for some process. Yeah, yes we do, yeah. yeah. Always keep, invite. You keep the mirror out of it. Yeah. <laughs> hey, you're welcome to come to any of the meetings. <laughs> Thank you. There's no more discussion or questions. 
May I have a mover? First year, right so is. <laughs> May I have a seconder? Okay, thank you. I'll now call the vote. All those in favor? All those opposed? <coughs> Motion carried. Number six, consent items. We will now move on to consent items. 5.1 the minutes. Oh, okay. May I have a mover and a seconder for the minutes from last meeting? I don't believe this was our mover. Seconder. Um, all those in favor? All those opposed? I'm just abstaining. Motion carried. Okay. <laughs> Motion carried. <laughs> okay, the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.